I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Um, today I would like to continue talking about um, logic and uh, there are certain uh, topics which uh, just couldn't be uh, touched in, in a very short lecture which uh, basically was the foundation of uh, logic which we have discussed before. Um, today I would like to talk about um, the relationship between logical um, expressions and most important relationship is implication. If one statement implies another statement, what does it actually mean? Well, um, we were talking about statements being truth, but having a logical value of truth or false. Um, yes, there are certain statements which are neither, and uh, we probably, yes, we did talk about this a little bit, but right now that's not the subject. Let's talk about subject of having a specific meaning of certain uh, uh, statements. Either the statement is truth or statement is false. And what can be actually uh, inferred from this? Inference or implication, all these words mean that let's assume that one particular statement is true. What follows from it? Well. If you can say that if the statement A, when it's truth, basically results in a statement that B is also truth, then we're saying that A implies B, or A is a sufficient condition for B. Well, sufficient is basically a general word, but in this case it's uh, quite obvious that you, you can use it. Yes for uh, making sure that the B is true, it is sufficient uh, to prove that A is true. Well, sometimes um, we can have conditions which are implying each other mutually, which means A is sufficient condition for B, and B is sufficient condition for A. Well, in this case, we can say that A is necessary and sufficient condition. So, there is another word which I have just used, a necessary. So, a um, necessary condition is the one um, which definitely needs to be uh, true if another condition is also true. Um, let me just exemplify it. Uh, basically, if A is sufficient for B, then B is sufficient for A. That's, that's the definition of that thing. As an example, um, let's consider that, um, for instance, I have uh, a pen. This is a statement. I have a pen. And let's consider another statement. I have a red pen. If I'm saying that I have a red pen, let's call this condition A and this condition B. If I'm saying I have a red pen, it actually means that I have a pen. So from B, we can follow, we can infer that the A is also true. So if B is true, then A is true. So B in this case is a sufficient condition for um, A. Is it a necessary condition? Or vice versa, is A a sufficient condition for B? Well, the answer is no, because if I have a pen, it doesn't really mean that I have a red pen. It might mean I have a black one, right? So A does not uh, imply B. So in this particular case, we have that B is sufficient condition for A. A is necessary condition for B. 
uh, and the reverse is not actually true. Let me give another example. Um, statement A. Number n is multiple of 3. It's like 3, 6, 9, all these multiples of 3. B, um, statement B is the following. Sum of digits of number n is multiple of 3. Well, these two statements are, well, they're quite remote from each other in terms of the previous uh, problem, the previous example which I made, pen and red pen, they were kind of close and it was kind of obvious that one uh, implies another and another doesn't imply the first one. In this case, it's completely different things. I mean, let's consider number 123. Well, on one hand, we have to think about whether it's multiple of 3, if it's divisible by 3 without remainder. On the other hand, we can summarize its digits, 1, 2, and 3, and make a decision about that number being uh, divisible by 3. And then we are saying that one actually might or might not imply another. We have to basically prove it. So this is a typical condition um, when we can prove a theorem, like if A, then B. If we can prove that theory, it means that the A is sufficient condition for B. If we can prove the, uh, the, theory, the theorem that from B actually um, follows A, so if sum of digits is multiple of 3, then the number, of, if number is multiple of 3, then it proves that the D is sufficient condition for, for A. Uh, so in this particular case, it goes both ways. And we can say that A and B are both necessary and sufficient conditions for each other. Well, let's try to prove it. Um, if we can take any number represented in decimal system, as you know, we can have its digits A0 times 10 to the nth degree plus A1 tens to the n minus 1 degree plus etc. So a0 and a1 are digits plus a n minus 1 10 to the first plus a n. So for the number 1 to 3, 123, this is a0 times 10 to the second degree, which is 100. So it's 100 plus 2 and this is times 10 to the first degree, so it's 2 tenths and plus 3. Again, this is my last digit. By the way, 123 actually is divisible by 3. You can check that out. And the sum of digits 1 and 2 and 3 is 6, which is also divisible by 3. So how can we prove that this particular number is divisible by 3? Well, actually, it's very easy. Why? Because let's write down the following thing. We will subtract a0 from this. We will subtract a1 from this. We will subtract a n minus 1 from this and we will subtract uh, uh, AM from this. Now, what do we have here? If you will group these two together, 
or these two together, you will have an expression a k times 10 to n minus k minus a k, right? Like a1 times 10 to the n minus 1 minus a1. Now this is a k times 10 to the n minus k minus 1. Now, this thing um, is obviously divide, divisible by 10 minus 1. We can prove it separately, but just trust me on this one. And 10 minus 1 is 9, so it's 9 times a k times some number n, whatever the name n is. So this expression is divisible by 10 minus 1, which is 9. And whatever remains is n, and 8k stays by itself. So what I'm saying is that if we will subtract from the big number some of its digits, by the way, this is intended to be minus, right? I'm subtracting. So if you subtract from a big number some of its digits, you will always have something divisible by 9, and therefore divisible by 3. Um, what does it mean? Well, it means that, let me just express this statement differently. If you have a number n, you subtract some of its digits, and you got something which is divisible by 9 and by 3. What does it mean? It means that if this is divisible by 3, or 9, this is definitely divisible by 3 and 9. It means that n should be divisible by 3 or 9. So we can say that the divisibility of some of the digits and divisibility of the number itself should always be in sync. If this is divisible, this should be divisible. And if this is not divisible, this is not divisible. And by the way, this is not only for 3, this is also for 9. So we kind of prove both uh, theorems. Number n is multiple of 3 or 9. And sum of digits of the number n is multiple of 3 or 9. So correspondingly. So they always go together. If this is divisible, then this is divisible. If this is divisible, then that is divisible. Which means we can prove this theorem in both ways. A is sufficient condition for B, and B is sufficient condition for A. So basically, this is a very short introduction into another aspect of logic, um, which is related to definition of what is necessary and what is sufficient condition. Um, I will also put a few um, little exercises for um, this particular topic, and uh, that's just for kind of uh, self-study. Um, it's basically an interesting thing, and uh, there is another aspect of this necessary and sufficient condition. It's related to set theory and geometry, if you wish. Um, you know that sets are usually represented geometrically. Like this is one set, and this is another set, which is which consists of elements of the first one. So this is a subset, so to speak. From the necessary and um, sufficient condition logic examples, we can actually use the same type of um, geometrical representation. Let me put it this way. Let's consider um, I have a statement. If point belongs to a subset, then it belongs to the bigger set. That seems to be obvious, right? So we can say that the belongingness of the point to a subset is a sufficient condition for uh, belongingness of that point to a bigger set. Um, vice versa, therefore. Belongingness of the point to a bigger set is a necessary condition for uh, belongingness of that point to a subset. 
So I can say that um, relationship between set and subset is really a, a good representation of necessary and sufficient conditions. So subset towards set is like a sufficient condition. And corresponding with set with good is sufficient. belong to a subset sufficient to belong a set. The reverse belong to a set. This is a necessary for belong to subset. The word necessary and the word sufficient, they, they do have their own everyday meaning, but in this case we are basically in the same um, in the same type of meaning. Mathematicians did not really invent any new meaning of that of, of that word. Because if we are saying that something is necessary for something else, it means that without it, that something else will not happen. Without our point to belong to a big set, we can't even think about it belonging to a subset, right? So that's why belonging to a set is a necessary condition to a subset. And vice versa, if I definitely know that the point belongs to um, a subset um, from it, it definitely follows that it belongs to an entire set. So it's quite sufficient. I have actually proved a stronger statement or, or use the stronger statement, point belongs to a subset. It's stronger than point belongs to a set. Set is too wide, subset is a small one. So if I have a statement that the point belongs to a small one, that definitely is sufficient for uh, this, this point uh, being belong to uh, a bigger set. So this is kind of a geometrical representation. This is sufficient. And this is necessary conditions. Just keep it in mind, whenever you have a, uh, this necessary and sufficient thing, you don't know which one is which, think about this geometrical representation. If you have proved something stronger, then that is sufficient condition. Stronger means smaller in this particular case. You are narrowing down your logic to a more precise definition. It's stronger than saying something on a broader basis. For instance, if I'm saying that uh, the number is divisible by 9, um, it's stronger than the number is divisible by 3. Because from divisibility by 9 definitely follows divisibility by 3. Um, which numbers are divisible by 9? 9, 18, 27, etc. Right? 9, 18, 27, etc. Which numbers are divisible by 3? 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18. Uh, so, as you see, there are more numbers which are divisible by 3. It's a bigger set than the numbers which is divisible by 9. So this is divisibility by 3, and this is divisibility by 9. As you see, 9, divisibility by 9, is smaller set. And according to this geometrical representation, this is sufficient condition for this. And obviously, divisibility by 3 is necessary, without which we can't even think about divisibility by 9. Okay, that's it for this uh, little addendum for our logic. Thank you very much.